welcome to lecture 3.1 on researching your deep history. This is a, um, a lecture that I decided to integrate into the course because there are so many of the same questions that tend to arise year after year and I thought I would put it down in a lecture and we'd have an opportunity to talk about that right now. And I'd like to start by emphasizing the fact that a lot of the best sources that you're going to find may be out of date. I do mention this in the written lecture that E.C. Pelou's After the Ice Age, which is a wonderful text, was published in 1992. That's, that, that's a long time ago and there is always uh, additional information being um, uh, being brought to the brought to the fore by current researchers, and uh, I wonder, Mark, you've uh, you're good friends with John Crock, consulting mm -hmm. archaeologist for right. the for the state of Vermont. Have you seen that yourself? That um, the speed at, at which information is revised in mm -hmm. paleoecology or archaeology sure, sure. Uh, picks up over time. Um, so I'm an anthropologist, not an ar not an archaeologist. So I, I don't keep up with the dates as well as other folks. But like you, I bump into it, and it's true that. Some of these cha things change really rapidly. Um, my buddy, John Croc, he's an archeologist at University of Vermont, gave a talk here at Green Mountain College a year or so ago. And we used to think that Vermont um, became unglaciated, deglaciated, maybe the first people 12, 12 and a half thousand years ago. And now John's saying more recent research is suspecting maybe even before 13,000 years ago. Uh, we see analogous things in other places. The Northwest Coast, we used to assume it was covered with an ice sheet and people couldn't have come down there. We now know that new models are suggesting that it thawed before the rest of this North American glacier, that the coast was open for potential uh, boat travel, boat hopping down the coast uh, b before we previously thought that was possible. Um, the Amazon, we used to think that people didn't modify this old growth forest very much. Uh, Archaeology in the last half generation has found burnt charcoal throughout major parts of the Amazon where people have burned forests and used it for agriculture. So yeah, um, find the newest information you can find because if it's 20 years old, it's likely changed <laughs> some. Um, that's great. I think the other thing, the, the other point I really want to um, emphasize in talking about sources is that some of you are going to find a really terrific source about your bioregion. There's going to be a temptation to rely heavily on that source. But uh, really one of the purposes of higher level research, graduate level research, is to uh, demonstrate your familiarity with a wide variety of sources. Um, so even if one source seems to do it all, you're still going to want to look for a variety of sources and synthesize them uh, in your work. One of the other sources that I really want to see from you is the, uh, the Smithsonian Handbook of North American Indians, uh, the appropriate volume for your area. It's great because it covers um, Paleo Indians, Archaic Indians, all the way on up to contact era uh, native cultures. And, and so it's a, a great place to get that and to get it from a variety of sources. Each, each chapter is written by a different uh, anthropologist uh, in that piece. One thing I want to warn you about as you're writing about native people, though, is making assumptions that the sustainability of their cultures had anything to do with their ethnicity. Um, and, and maybe I can turn this question to you for sure. just a moment, Mark. Uh, what, how, how can you avoid that danger of slipping into sort of an, uh, an ethnic, uh, romanticized... Uh, a good ethnic. education. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, so I teach a course here, Indigenous America. In the first day, I try to make this point that when we say Native Americans, we tend to think of this clump of people. Anytime you hear Native Americans, you should, your first question should be, should be who, when, and where? Because we had 300 different language groups north of the Rio Grande. We had groups that you know, functionally went around in groups of 10 or 12 people digging roots in the Great Basin deserts, all the way to cities of 20,000 people near St. Louis. Uh, any particular group changed through time. Um, and I quote the first chapter of this book I use, there has never been such a thing as uh, culturally or biologically a typical Native American. So that's a good place to start. Think of variation and work your way into details from there. Um, for the rest of it, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick story. I went to graduate school with this guy named Greg Keyes. You may know him. He dropped out of, he was brilliant, dropped out of graduate school and now writes science fiction and fantasy books. And they're like on the New York Times bestseller books. But he was raised on a, new, uh, on a Native American reservation. And one day at University of Georgia, he had to give a speech to like the Sustainability Society. And he said, I know what they're expecting. They, they're expecting the Chief Seattle speech. So he goes into this hallway, 200 people are sitting there, 
And he says, if you think that somehow Native Americans have a special gene that makes them more harmonious with the earth, you're racist. And 200 people go, oh, you know, and then he goes on to just make the same points that we're making. Um, sure, Native Americans may have been more sustainable than us. So were small scale subsistence producing tribal or chieftain level people everywhere. Um, we can argue. And your reading by John Bodley argues this. So, yeah, start by thinking of Native Americans as a certain scale of societies like we find anywhere. Mm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Um, I guess so. Uh, one of the other things that I'd like to stress as we move forward with thinking about this is how you're going to structure the narrative. I do touch on this in the written lecture, but the most successful versions of these deep histories I've seen move from the beginning to the present in a sequential way and tend to punctuate the, the narrative in terms of changes in climate, changes in ve vegetation. And if we look at changes in human culture as uh, being in, in, to some extent driven by changes in climate and changes in the vegetation available and the, the wildlife available, then that allows us to see the different stages of human inhabitation of your bioregion as responding to changes in climate, which is obviously very much the point of this graduate program as we are in the age of climate change now and we're thinking about how do our communities need to evolve. This is the latest in a long sequence of, um, of these sorts of adaptations. Um, I guess the final thing I would say, I want to wrap this up, is you're going to learn so much from the scholars that you read, um, but you're really going to incorporate that learning into your way of seeing your bioregion by telling your story in plain words. I don't want academic mm -hmm. jargon. I want you to write for somebody with a high school education to tell the long story of the place that you live in a way that anybody would find interesting. That's a challenge. But by meeting that challenge, that pretty much uh, assures that you're going to process that information. You're not simply going to be repeating threads of jargon that you've read here or there along the way. So I think we'll wrap this up for today. Thank you. Have fun with this project. It may be the most, uh, in some ways, uh, transformative project you've ever done in terms of shaping the way that you relate to the place that you live. See you next time. Mm -hmm.